a very exciting place. Uh, it's it's one of of almost um, <laughs> exuberant confusion. Uh, I think that on the one hand, we're thrilled by the progress that has taken place and that has taken place, quite frankly, in a very short period of time. I mean, I'm a historian, so I always take the long view of things. And when you think about the kind of progress that's been made for LGBT people just in the last five or 10 years, much less over the course of the last 40, uh, since Stonewall, it's astonishing the amount of progress that's been made. Uh, and again, when you compare it to the black civil rights struggle, the amount of progress that we've made has been uh, has been quite accelerated in comparison to the long black freedom struggle that dates back to, uh, on this continent, to the arrival of the first slaves in 1619. We talk about four centuries of a black freedom struggle, and you're talking about four decades of a queer freedom struggle. You know, it puts it in perspective, and I'm constantly trying to, to use comparisons when they're useful uh, to make that point. And so on the one hand, we're thrilled. Uh, and, and, and there's been enormous progress on a whole range of fronts. Uh, but, you know, there is still some frustration. When you think about the insidious prejudices and discriminations that Harvey Milk and folks were fighting against 30 years ago, and then you think about Prop 8 and the Arkansas Ballot Initiative, which banned uh, a single adoption and was really energized, the, the movement behind the passage of that uh, ballot initiative was really uh, deeply rooted in the same kinds of prejudices and the same kinds of discriminations, the equation of homosexuality with pedophilia, uh, which which is something that we're still battling against, that kind of stigma that if you let us near our ch your children, we're going to molest them, which is absurd. Um, and so those kinds of things endure. And so I think there is a great uh, frustration, on the other hand, in our community that progress hasn't come further, that there are still those stigmas and those prejudices against us, and that we're still battling in the political arena, and that we're still, uh, you know, sort of 15 years after Bill Clinton took on Don't Ask, Don't Tell and signed the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, that we're still, in many ways, at ground zero, where we were uh, 15 or so years ago. And so I think there's, on the one hand, exhilaration over the progress, and we have to uh, acknowledge how much progress has been made. But on the other hand, I think there's real frustration, uh, which you've seen in recent weeks uh, um, with the president, uh, the new president, and with his Justice Department in the brief that they uh, uh, put forward defending uh, the law, the Defense of Marriage Act law, which is still on the books. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, one of the things that I think is happening, we should understand that no president of the United States has ever been at the forefront of social transformation. When you think about Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, when he came into office, was cautiously anti-slavery. And he was a colonizationist, and he, was, and he expressed very openly and also privately white supremacist views. He didn't think that black folks and white folks could live together in the same country and get along with one another. And this had been the long view of presidents dating back uh, even to, you know, certainly Jefferson, and even in some ways uh, Washington and others. Uh, there was a deep belief among uh, presidents in the 19th century, in the late 18th century, that black folks and white folks weren't meant to get along. They weren't meant to live side by side on terms of equality despite the nation's founding promises. Uh, and so Lincoln had to come along. And Lincoln was pushed by black folks. He was pushed by Frederick Douglass. He was pushed by Harriet Tubman. He was pushed by Martin Delaney to have troops fight for the Union cause, to pay them properly, to emancipate the slaves, and ultimately to come up with a new vision for the country, to change his thinking such that black folks and white folks could live in a biracial democracy. That took him some time. Same thing with Franklin Roosevelt and the labor movement, right? Franklin Roosevelt did didn't come into office thinking that unions, that people have the right to collectively bargain and that unions should be part of our social, political, and economic fabric. Uh, he had to move to get to that position. Lyndon Baines Johnson, uh, right, celebrated as the president who signed the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, certainly very important to that story and that history, had to be moved. I mean, Frank, you know, LBJ was someone who was known to use the N-word in closed chambers when he was bargaining in the Senate. This was a man who was from Texas, who was from rural Texas, uh, and he had to be moved on the issue of civil rights. None of these men ever made it to the point the end point in their lives, in many cases, because they, they, they um, you know, Lincoln obviously was shot, uh, Roosevelt died in office, and then uh, Lyndon Johnson stepping down because of the Vietnam conflict, that all of these presidents moved from a place of, of uh, one place politically to another more enlightened and more progressive place. But all three of those presidents were moved by social movements, and the same is going to be true of President Obama. 
President Obama is not the leader of our social movement. He may sign legislation that will be a culmination of and a victory for our movement. But Barack Obama is not our leader as an LGBT community. He is an ally. He needs to become a better ally. But I have faith based on what I saw in the campaign and what I know of his, uh, his essential decency uh, and progressive principles. I have faith that his administration is going to be the best administration for LGBT rights uh, uh, that we've ever had in American history before it's all over.